This video is brought to you by Storyblocks. Once I had Fujifilm's GFX 100S in hand, a single image I took with a single lens told me all I needed to know about it. But then, I learned a whole lot more. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to follow up on my initial impressions of the GFX 100S after having it in hand on the streets of New York, and then in the rolling hills of Dutch Amish country in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. But before we get into it, I want to share with you that this video is brought to you by Storyblocks, because I sought them out after making Storyblocks my stock footage resource. It's a one-stop shop, which is royalty-free, subscription-based, accessibly priced, with unlimited downloads. We use Storyblocks with turnaround times and low, predictable costs that were unimaginable just a few years ago for channels and production firms like ours. Or yours. If you're a video creator with an ambitious vision for your project, a one-man band, a small agency, or a production company, leveraging the reach and skill of people around the world through existing assets that they've created is the way to achieve that vision in the shortest, most cost-effective time frame possible. No worries about monetization or copyright issues. So check them out. Visit them at storyblocks.com slash Hugh. Thanks, Storyblocks. Okay. I'm not going to waste your time or mine rehashing everything I said in that first impressions video. Instead, I encourage you to check it out, along with a number of other videos we've done on their medium format lineup from the GFX 50S to the original GFX 100 and their excellent 45 to 100 F4 zoom. I'll put links to all of them down in the description below and up above if I remember. For now, I'll just cut to the chase. The GFX 100S is incontrovertibly, in my estimation, the most accessibly performant digital medium format camera on the planet. There is no other larger than full frame camera of which I'm aware that offers as high or higher resolution at remotely as low a price, $6,000 in the US. Heck, a larger than full frame camera that offers half the resolution is as richly featured and performant for video and offers the foundational technologies of in-body image stabilization and autofocus required to most fully consistently take advantage of those megapixels and that video capability out in the field, either at all or as well executed. It is the sweet spot in Fujifilm's current medium format lineup. I think it's fair to assert it is the sweet spot in the entire segment. 
whether we're talking about Hasselblad's lovely, filled with personality and blessed with heritage, build quality and beautiful glass, 50 megapixel, $6,000, give or take, X1D2 and 907X mirrorless offerings. They're larger, almost 645 sized, 100 megapixel, $33,000 H60 100C and $48,000 multi-shot pixel shifting H60 400C DSLRs. Phase 1's beautifully conceived and designed, even more expensive, 150 megapixel, $57,000 XT, or like as work of art, 64 megapixel, $20,000 S3. But I guess we can't talk about all of these megapixels across all of these medium format systems without also addressing the idea that computational imaging, either pixel shifting or the announcement of and subsequent pronouncements on Adobe's AI-based super resolution, at least in its launch implementation, spells the end of high resolution sensors. Because while I'm a big fan of computational imaging, especially for exposure blending and focus stacking, and I've created pixel shifted images from a 20 megapixel micro four thirds G9 that rivals images taken on the same shoot with a 50 megapixel medium format X1D, the notion that this technology has reached the point where it can supplant resolution is, it's just absurd, at least for now. None of this, however, means that I don't have nits to pick with the GFX100S, nor that the GFX100S doesn't face formidable competition, because I do, and it does. The hard reality is this. Competition from full-frame cameras is especially intense if one is willing to set aside preconceived notions about what actually digital medium format is and is not, how much resolution one needs in the real world of crafting images of beauty, substance, emotion, and impact, and what value one places on size, weight, and cost, not just for the body, but for lenses and accessories. Though, with all of this said, holy crap! Beyond incredible resolution, the GFX100S has stunning tonality and color and has me thinking about an entirely new direction for some of my image making. I think it could help me better communicate my joy of and endless fascination with the light, textures, shapes, colors, juxtapositions, and people inhabiting the streets of New York. Maybe even rural Lancaster. Think legendary photographer Joel Meyerowitz's 8x10 Deardorff view camera period, when he wanted to give people practically limitless opportunity to see new things each time they came back to view one of the images he captured with it. This, to me, is one of two things this GFX100S system is about. First, very large, incredibly detailed prints viewed at closer than normal viewing distances created without the tripod, dark cloth, futzing with upside-down images or sheet film holders of a view camera. And second, the opportunity to use resolution instead of lenses to get the shots one needs, irrespective of genre or use case per se, which I find fascinating. Most of you already know the headline features of the GFX100S, but for those of you who don't, and to quickly recap so that we can move past them with a comment or two along the way, it has the same fabulous in-body image stabilized 102 megapixel BSI sensor with hybrid phase detect autofocus of the original $10,000 GFX100.
It has all of the originals, photography and video chops, but a longer 120 minute recording limit. Same three-way articulating screen in the rear. Same GF lens mount for access to Fujifilm's truly excellent medium format glass. Same, some might even say better build quality for a whopping $4,000 less. Fujifilm really sweated the details in this one, which is important to understand because it speaks to their ambition for and commitment to the line. Those details include new, smaller IBIS and shutter units. Autofocus performance, it has to be said, better than any full-frame L-mount camera body in the market today. They even approved the rear nubbin for navigating autofocus points in the menu system. Yay. Though, it would be nice if they addressed all the other fiddly secondary switch gear. Think winter glove usable. It would be better if they found a way to replace the micro HDMI port with a full-sized one. It would be better if they completely reworked their software interface because it has gotten long in the tooth, especially compared to the latest from Hasselblad, Leica, and Blackmagic. In the category of what we'll call teething problems amenable to firmware update, the charging indicator icon doesn't show up on the top display, though it does show up through the EVF and on the rear screen, and they ought to be able to fix that. Small beans. But the big one for me is this. It would be better if they'd found a way to retain the original's tiltable, detachable 5.76 million dot 0.86 mag EVF. Instead, it appears Fujifilm rated the parts bin for the same 3.7 million dot OLED unit with 0.77 magnification found in their rangefinder style GFX50R, which really never did it for me, which is unique in my experience with Fujifilm. But let's talk about the things that really struck me once I had the GFX100S in hand out in the field. One. It feels great in hand, as well-built and balanced as one could have hoped. I think it feels as good or better than what I considered the gold standard for decades, my Canon 1D, even as the 100S is smaller and lighter. Two, the shutter is exceptionally quiet and well-damped, I'd say industry-leading. Three, on the other hand, while the new nubbin is indeed an improvement, it's not nearly as smooth or precise as I'd like it to be. I was constantly overshooting where I wanted the crosshairs, which is not an inconsequential thing because you'll be using it a lot. Four, more importantly, was this. With an appropriately wide strap, I use Peak Designs, and a single lens, I was able to carry the 100S for hours on end without complaint. Bravo, Fujifilm. I would carry it with me on the streets of New York. That sounds kind of like Dr. Seuss. Five. But I really, really missed the tilting EVF. It allows me a different perspective, literally, than I get shooting at eye level, almost as if I'm shooting waist level with an old school Raleigh Flex or Hasselblad film camera. I'd prefer the higher resolution and magnification of the 100s finder, but I'd still be happy with the same lower resolution tiltable OLED unit of the 50S. The tiltable EVF has been a competitive differentiator for the GFX series when compared to full frame cameras and most other mirrorless medium format offerings, and its excision from the GFX100S stings. I'll put it like this. The good news is that the GFX100S feels like a substantial, consequential, but manageable full-frame camera. The bad news is that without the tiltable EVF, it feels like a full-frame camera. Six, back to good news. The three-way tilting rear panel works really well for photography. I found myself using it more often than I have in the past because it allowed me an unobtrusiveness on the street I just can't get with my own fixed rear panel like a SL2. Seven, even though it's heavier than any single GF Prime within its range, the 32-64 F4, which I was using for the first time, knocked my socks off to my utter astonishment because I'm a Prime's kind of guy. I think it is the street lens or general carry lens for the 100S. This is in spite of the particular appeal to me of their smaller and lighter 30mm f3.5, the full frame equivalent of my favorite wide angle focal length 24. And to my delight, I found the 30 to be in the same league optically as the superb 110mm f2 and 23mm f4, with better, smoother, quieter, and faster autofocus quite suitable for video. This is in spite of their much smaller and lighter 50mm 3.5, the full-frame equivalent of a 40mm 2.8, a new favorite of mine, which mounted on the 100S is actually lighter than my SL2 with Aposumicron 35 F2, though it is almost a half a pound heavier when I swap out the Apo for the tiny but surprisingly enjoyable and optically performant Sigma DGDN 35 F2 or 45 2.8. 
I think I'd still rate the 3264 my first choice for street or general carry in spite of their almost as small and light but older 63 2.8. This is close to the same field of view and depth of field as my Sigma 45 2.8 or my manual focus only Leica Summicron M50. Both are much smaller. But unlike the newer zooms and that 33.5 prime, the 63's autofocus, like the GF50, and for that matter, the newest 81.7, is strictly 80s era loud and steppy, best left for photography. Although, now that I've just run through it with you, I probably could be convinced to carry just the 53.5 on the street. With that field of view, more than a pound lighter, dramatically smaller and less obtrusive, and priced at $1,000 less than half the price of the 32 to 64. Yeah, I could go there. Eight, despite all of that, I trade off the 100S's 41 extra megapixels for Sigma's tiny, jewel-like, much, much smaller, lighter, and unobtrusive full-frame 61 megapixel FPL as a daily driver on the street if and when the FPL becomes available with IBIS, performant autofocus, and a smaller, centrally located, tiltable EVF. Because in this scenario, street, size, weight, lens, selection, and then, of course, price, reigns supreme. Then again, who has to wait? Sony's A7R 4 can give you all of that right now, sans the tilting part, for three grand. Because, hey, credit where credit is due. Nine. For those of you who may be wondering, no, I'm not selling my SL2 system for a 100S or an A7R4 or an FPL. I will continue to be delighted by what I already have. Trading off the possibility of the GFX 100S's whopping 55 megapixel and articulating screen and autofocus advantages for the smaller size, lighter weight, stupendous build quality, superior Ergos, EVF, IBIS, in fact, of joy of shooting with and superior lens selection for my SL2. But that's just me and my personal history with the brand. Your mileage may vary, and that's fine. But if I didn't have that history, if I weren't already invested in Leica, well, that might be a very different story. It might be a very different story on a project basis very soon to be determined. I'll get back to you on that, maybe. But 10. Lastly, forget about me. What about you? Because the question we each have to ask ourselves is this. Do I truly need 100 megapixels? What are the actual use cases when the increased resolution on the one hand, increased size, weight, cost, and smaller, narrower lens ecosystem on the other Makes sense. What can't I do with what I have that I can, need, and want to do with a GFX 100S system? Especially since for those few of us who do want or need more than the usual 24 megapixels, options exist for moving up to what used to be the exclusive domain of digital medium format resolution while remaining in the full frame fold and, as a result, keeping our investment in glass for them. I'm talking, of course, not only about my own SL2, but its cousin, the Panasonic S1R, Nikon's Z7 II and Z7, actually, Sony's A7R4 and A7R3 and A7R2 and A1 and Canon's R5. All dramatically smaller, lighter and faster, some with better IBIS, some with better autofocus, some with 6K or 8K video, yet save for the SL2 and A1, also less expensive than the 100S with much wider and deeper lens ecosystems. Oh, vis-a-vis -vis IBIS. Think of the GFX 100S's IBIS as an amazing alternative to a tripod, especially with IS boost for pans and your golden. But think of it as an alternative to a gimbal and your hose. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So, when does one go for 102 megapixels worth of medium format goodness instead of full frame APS-C or even micro four thirds goodness? Because they all have goodness. It's quite likely that the GFX 100S will appeal to well-heeled crop sensor shooters who want dramatically more resolution than those formats can give them. Currently, 32 megapixels is the limit in APS-C, just 20 in micro four thirds, and figure, hey, if I'm going to give up the size and convenience, let's make it worth it, blowing right by full frame's current 61 megapixel limit. I understand. Clearly, Fujifilm understands. Though, 
how long before we have a 100 megapixel full frame sensor? Six months, 18 months, three years, higher resolution micro four thirds sensors, APS-C sensors. It's quite likely that the GFX 100S will appeal to well-heeled full frame shooters who value somewhere between 67 and 140% more megapixels than they can get from Sony, Canon, Nikon, Panasonic, or like a full frame models today and or who simply prefer its ergos and heft. I understand again. Not so much for anyone looking for that medium format look once they think about it, however, though I understand this too. That's because the measurable differences between medium format and full frame in the digital era are much smaller than they were in the film days when the medium format look was born. A 6x6 negative is literally more than four times the size of a 35mm negative, but most of today's medium format sensors are just 70% larger than full frame. As a result, differences in tonality, dynamic range, noise between full frame and medium format digital are often either surmountable in post or, you know, irrelevant given how most people consume images these days. The differences between lenses back in the day, say between the classic 6x6 coverage Zeiss Planar 80mm f2.8, the full frame equivalent field of view and depth of field of a 45mm f2 using a 0.55 crop factor, are somewhere between much less significant and actually reversed when comparing today's best lenses across formats. This begins with the fact that though differences in field of view for the same object size will remain, they will be more subtle. But it is also the case that the image quality gap has narrowed dramatically. Think Fujifilm's 110 f2 and Sigma's DGDN 85 1.4. They are within spitting distance of each other from a field of view and depth of field perspective. The 110 f2 is the full frame equivalent of an 88mm f1.6, and both are extraordinarily sharp and crispy. I would give the edge just to the Fujinon for chromatic aberration if memory serves, but it's close. And the 110 is both bigger and more expensive, $2,800 compared to the 85 at just $1,200. Though between now and April 18th, I just saw, there's a $500 mail-in rebate for the 110 available, so check it out. If you are or are intent on becoming a GFX shooter, I think the 110 should be a staple of your kit. It's not just that differences in the image capture chain have narrowed either. The very modularity that was the hallmark of medium format has also lost much of its value. We don't need interchangeable film backs because we can shoot hundreds of images on a card and change ISO, color, and more in camera or in post. Not so much for monochrome cameras. We don't need interchangeable finders as much because we have articulating screens, usually. Though I'll say it again, I personally love the GFX 50S and 100's long, tiltable EVFs. I wish other manufacturers would figure out just how powerful a tool this can be. We certainly don't need the ability to add motor winders because now all digital cameras have automatic advance and burst modes, which are much faster. Differences in resolution remain for now, but the window is closing. I've said this a number of times as well, not only because of megapixels, but because of the advances made in full frame long lenses. But the 100S may well appeal most to a third group, and that is medium format shooters, film or digital, whatever their genre, who are looking to exit their current system for something easier to use and more accessibly priced. Maybe even make some money in the, and I'm using air quotes here, downgrade process. Depending upon whom you ask, and depending on film emulsion, a classic 6x6 negative, or for the non-metric among us, 2 and a quarter square, could resolve in the range of a 90 to 300 megapixel sensor. So there you go. These observations lead us to some very interesting arguments. You can, for example, argue that in spite of the incredible results I got with the original GFX 100 and the 110mm f2,
neither it nor the GFX100S are ideal for portrait or fashion photography. I'd actually agree with you. It's really pretty much overkill, except when that portrait is fine art or for archival purposes. I mean, just think about how much retouching we already do at 24 megapixels, and then think about the resolutions at which, and the media through which, these kinds of images are displayed for whom? I mean, have you actually looked at a fashion magazine cover recently? What happened? I'm talking image quality. You can argue, it's pretty much unarguably true, in fact, that the GFX100S is not for sports or wildlife. No lens is long enough, stabilized enough, no burst rate fast enough, no buffer big enough, at least not for those of us weaned on Canon 1Ds, Nikon D whatevers, or Sony A9 series. Really, the primary thing that the latest 1DX Mark III, D6, or A1 have in common with the 100S is the $6,000 plus price tag. But these are sports and wildlife machines with long lenses, autofocus, burst rates, and buffers big enough to match. Though, you know what, guys? Don't forget what Munkowski was able to capture without any of that stuff back in the early days of the 20th century. Yeah, okay, the A1 crushes them all for video. You can argue that the GFX100 is not great for event photography, documentary photography, or photojournalism either, because as a system including lenses, it's still too big, too heavy, too expensive, and too slow, at least for those of us weaned on Canon 5Ds, Nikon D800 series, or Sony's A7 series for the display media and audiences of today. Okay, I can go there with you as well. Size, weight, speed, budget, these are considerations which figure prominently in any purchase decision for these genres. And you can argue that the GFX100S is not ideal for video. Ideal? Yes. I hear you. I agree. Not because it isn't highly performant for video. It is. I'll spare you the breathless spec reading, though it is impressive. And in fact, I'm recording this video with it right now using the 32 to 64. But because first, one cannot take advantage of the extra megapixels paid for since the camera is limited to 4K anyway. And second, if Claudia or I or you are going to carry that much weight, especially handheld, which is how we B-roll. It's kind of cute. It better have an internal neutral density filter, which it doesn't. It doesn't have unlimited recording, though 120 minutes, which is an improvement over the original 100. Never mind that on a camera this size, there ought to be a full-size ATMI port, as I mentioned earlier. At least it does have dedicated mic and headphone jacks, unlike Fujifilm's APS-C lineup. There simply are much smaller, lighter, faster, and less expensive alternatives, some without recording limit at all, from Fujifilm's own APS-C X-D4, actually that does have a limit, to the X-S10, which doesn't, to Panasonic's Micro Four Thirds GH5, which doesn't, and G9, which does, their full-frame S5, which doesn't, their S1 series, Nikon's crop and full-frame Z series, Canon's EOS R6 and R7, Sony's A1, you get the point, especially since I've made it so many times already today. Though, if 102 megapixels worth of resolution is what you require for photography, and you want to do some video as an adjunct, well, fair enough, you can use the GFX100S to great effect, and don't need to carry a different body with different lenses. The imagery is beautiful. But repeat after me, you will feel that weight as soon as you pick it up and start shooting handheld, and every accessory will have to be suitably scaled up in capacity, weight, and price. Which leaves us with well, what then? On the one hand, the fullest expression of the GFX100S lies in its photographic capabilities. The Fujinon lenses for it are all of a very high caliber, alternating between lovely and superb. And when those lenses in the line which do exhibit 1980s era steppiness are used for photography only, the 50, the 63, even the 81.7, that liability recedes into nothingness. Really, the GFX100S shines most brightly in scenarios where highest resolution is warranted, but pixel shifting isn't suitable. Or it is, but you want to go high-end where Hassi or Phase 1 is champagne taste on beer budget. In either case, they're out of reach for you. Which really means, A, landscape, where in fact pixel shifting just won't work well. 
be it rural or urban. You simply can't do those slow shutter speed moving water shots, for example. And I have personally never been able to get a perfectly registered pixel shift image doing urban landscapes in New York because even the trunks on the street or the subways below are enough to muck up a half or one pixel shift. Never mind that for years now, skyscrapers have been designed to sway in the breeze. I used to get nauseated while working on the 98th floor of the original World Trade Center. And while the rural landscape of the Scottish Highlands is magnificent, wind, even with Panasonic's clever pick-the-best-single-image-for-the-moving-bits technology, can still wreak havoc on the shot. When it comes to landscape, 100 megapixels in a single frame, or stitched together for a panorama, can be breathtaking. Potentially easier than full frame, too, because there can be fewer images with which one has to contend. B. Priceless art documentation. This is when pixel shifting comes into its own if you can isolate all vibration and what you are photographing demands every pixel. Like an archival record of Vermeer's The Little Street shot inside the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in the wee hours of the morning after the partying has abated. And if you're going to pixel shift, might as well start with 100 megapixels, give or take. This is, after all, how Hasselblad gets to the H60 400C, aimed precisely at that market. C. Highest-end product and architectural shots, like Pedro Guerrero's images of Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin West, though he used a film view camera years ago. No other option. And let's get real. If the images are going to be shown through the internet, printed in magazines, we don't need resolution this high either, pixel shift or not. Although it's just as true that no camera lens combination in the Fujifilm lineup can match a view camera's tilts, shifts, and swings. You can do a lot of that in post. I feel a GFX 100 S 4x5 Comparo coming on. Then D, right, there's street photography for the 1% of us, the 1% of the time we want to overwhelm our viewers with large-scale prints viewed at closer than normal viewing distances. I know I've said this before. Because we want to share just how magnificent are the textures, tonalities, faces, colors, shapes, juxtapositions, and movement of the world's major cities in a way lower resolution, stitching and or pixel shifting just can't handle. And E, video. Though I'd never recommend the GFX 100S as a primary video camera on its own, as I've already said and explained. But if... Life magazine existed today, the way it did almost a century ago, where images came first and were respected. The 100S's additional video capabilities would be wonderful for BTS. I could definitely see recommending a 100S based system for that purpose. Even if it doesn't have a flippy screen. I did mention at the outset Adobe's super resolution and the assertion in some quarters that because of it, high resolution sensors are a thing of the past. And I have pushed a follow-up as late in the video as I dare, so let's face it squarely. Stop talking smack. AI doesn't reveal details that were never there. In fact, let's take a look at these two images shot one after the other a few weeks ago in Brooklyn. The image on the left was done with the 102 megapixel GFX 100S and the GF 32 64 millimeter F4 set at 32 millimeters. We're going to use the clock tower for the basis of comparison. Next, XE4, which clearly I didn't sweat over getting exactly lined up. Close enough, though, for this comparison. Since that 32mm is the full-frame equivalent of a 24, and the XF27 is the full-frame equivalent of, call it a 40, a slight edge in object size within the frame may accrue to the smaller censored camera, though I tried to tee them up as best I could. Now let's enhance with Adobe's Super Resolution, first with the XE4. By the way, even though this is an M1 MacBook Pro, Lightroom is still really slow. I'm also not seeing any difference between the two views. It's either a bug or I'm just being impatient. Anyway, let's get it going. It's working on it. There we go. Let's check it out.
Notice, by the way, that this is pixel peeping at just about 600%. Let's compare this to the unenhanced image. There's definitely a difference, impressive in its own way. You can more clearly see the clock's hands, though we could see them before too. Now let's do the same thing with the GFX 100S file. You can already see it has much more actual resolution and detail, but let's see if we can enhance it too. But, okay, let's hit super resolution and see what happens. I'll probably edit out a bunch of the waiting time. Let's zoom in. Okay, it looks like something did happen. Now let's compare it to the enhanced version of the XE4's 24 megapixel image. Right. No magic. No end of the high resolution sensor wars. Then again, we're pixel peeping, which I hate doing because that clock tower is not the point of this image in any way, shape, or form. This is the image that I strove to capture. It's more appropriate to think of super resolution not as magic, nor the end of the resolution race, but as a tool that improves upon traditional edge sharpening and mundanely, if more importantly, smooths out the jaggies when the enlargement becomes too great or the scrutiny too great to allow those jaggies to remain. So if jaggies are your problem, okay, fine, use super resolution. Otherwise, forget about it. To quote the great Shakespearean philosopher Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. Let's wrap things up this way. In the end, you don't need any of those specifics. You can throw all of that out the window with a thought experiment as simple as this. Do you truly understand what you need that you can't get from what you have and the particular set of trade-offs the 100S represents? I hope I've helped in that latter regard. Are you willing to accept those trade-offs in order to leverage the sensor's resolution instead of futzing with stitching or pixel shifting or carrying and using multiple lenses irrespective of use case or the competition? If so, just buy into the 100S system and prepare to be odd. This video was brought to you by Storyblocks. To learn more, visit www.storyblocks.com slash you. Thanks, Storyblocks. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below, picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com, sending coffee money via PayPal, or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.